Hey everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Bureau Briefing Live. We are coming to you today with our good friend, Dr. Randy Blazak. How are you, sir? Hey, I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. And as most of you know, today's show, we were originally going to be focusing on the book Blind Spot, talking all about hidden biases and how we can get of our own out of our own way so we can be better people. Uh, and then in the community, we found out about Randy, and he was introduced to us, and you know, I don't want to put a lot of pressure on him, but he's kind of a badass. And so we're going to hear a lot. Dude, you went undercover with the skinheads. Come on. Yeah. Well. Like, don't, don't deflect that. That's kind of an amazing thing. Um, before we jump in, I do want to thank our sponsors, MailChimp, Envision, and Platform SH. They have been doing a lot for us uh, as we go through all of these changes. And with that, uh, why don't we find out a little bit about you, Randy? Um, share with everybody a little bit of your, about your background and kind of what drew you into this work. Yeah, I mean, it's a big story, but I think, uh, I think where it ties into our conversation today is that it's been very helpful in understanding what the heck is going on in the world right now. Um, I grew up in a town in Georgia called Stone Mountain, which is famous for a big rock that sticks out of the ground, uh, thus the name Stone Mountain. There's a Confederate carving, which I'm sure is now <laughs> the center of much debate. Uh, and one of the reasons, Stone Mountain is famous for a couple reasons. It's mentioned in Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech in 1963. Uh, which we're about to uh, mark again this summer. And there's a part where he says, let freedom ring, I, I, I'm gonna sound just like him. Let freedom ring from the hills and the mole hills of Mississippi and from Stone Mountain in Georgia. And I was a kid, I was like, oh yeah, that's my town, woo, woo, woo. Uh, you know, it's a very famous speech, like my little town. But the reason Dr. King mentioned my town is it's the birthplace of the modern Ku Klux Klan. Uh, in 1915, uh, this guy named uh, Doc, saw the movie Birth of a Nation and said, that looks like a good idea and tried to revive the Klan. The first cross burning was on top of uh, Stone Mountain on um, Thanksgiving night, 1915, starting a, you know, a century of terror uh, on the, from the modern Klan. So I grew up around the Klan and, and I thought every town had a Klan. Uh, you know, I had friends whose parents were in the Klan, or fathers really, and um, they provided basically a sort of a framework that, how of how we thought about race, uh, including Atlanta, which is just sort of over the hill from from Stone Mountain as this scary uh, black city. And then I went uh, off to college. Luckily, I went to a place called Emory University, uh, which is a pretty good school. And I took a sociology class because I had a break between my chemistry class and my physics class. And it blew my friggin' mind. We used to call it the everything you know is wrong class. And it really helped me to start to understand how race works. And then I thought, I thought before we were even having conversations about things like white privilege, I thought, well, I have an obligation to try to understand why people like me, because one, my best friend, uh, one of my best friends from school became the exalted Cyclops of the Southern Knights of the KKK. And uh, I, what, you know, why are people that I know going into that world? And so w once I entered graduate school, I started a kind of long-term field study. Uh, of the racist skinheads, which were kind of the new hate group on the scene in the late 1980s, 1980s. And so I spent on and off about uh, six years undercover in the white supremacist movement, which led to my um, my dissertation work, trying to understand, because it's very easy, you know, this is the us versus them thing that comes up in the book, you know, the way we sort people into groups, to think about ra racist as a separate category of people those bad people and us good woke liberal whatever people you know that we're so different we're like genetically different or something you can tell by you know, like how beady their eyes are that they're racist um <laughs> and when, of course what i found out was that you know other than the sort of explanations for why this phenomenon was happening they weren't they weren't different from me at all you know there was just a right. series of circumstances that we fell into that pushed my friend into the clan and me into a, a lifetime doomed as a sociologist um, and so, so yeah, that's the quick version of my, of my origin story, yeah. but it's been, you know, it, uh, all that time spent studying the skinheads in the eighties and the nineties has become incredibly valuable in understanding what's happening in the country right now. And maybe mm -hmm. we can get into some of those parallels, but, um, yeah. I, I came to Portland in 95 and took a, a tenure track position in Portland state because I wanted to be, be in a place where there is a, there's still a problem with organized racism. I mean, there's a problem with organized racism everywhere, but Portland has a little bit of a history, including a pretty brutal murder by uh, three skinheads of an Ethiopian immigrant in 1988 that kind of put Portland on the map in all the wrong ways. Um, so that's why I ended up here in, in Stumptown. There you go. 
so talking about the book for a second, um, and you and I were chatting a little before. I, I read the book. Uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, and it was it was a shock for me, like a lot of people, uh, because you know I I joked that my parents were Mississippi liberals, um, and they were run out of there pretty quick. Uh, but when I read this book and, and you find out about the IAT test and then you take the test and then you realize, you know, I, I judge people based on their race mm -hmm. and I judge people based on their weight and I judge people based on their sexual orientation. I judge all these things that I didn't know I did, but it's, it's that immediate judgment. And then there's that reflective judgment where you're just like, oh, well, that's just a normal human. That's a person. They're loving who they love. They're doing what they do. Um, when you do, cause I know you do anti-bias training, right? Like, how do you get people? And I think this is important for everybody listening. How do we get to a point where we understand the conflict within us? How are we able to look at that? Yeah, that's such a good question because we think, you know, I like to sort of broadly summarize about how we tackle these issues of bias in our society. And I think this is one of the things that's happening right now with the marches that are happening probably as we're sitting here is that we haven't tackled them en enough and in a sufficient way. And so I talk about sort of three levels. One are the institutional ways we address it. So getting rid of Jim Crow and changing not just the laws of the land, uh, but also the laws at our workplace, the, the rules of engagement at a, at a law firm or at a university or at a you know, government office. And so how we you know, institute equitable hiring practices and things like that. So when we say institution, we just don't mean changing a law here and there. It's really sort of the institutions that we exist in, including our faith institutions. Uh, we, we tackle them on a cultural level, how we hang out on a Friday night. You know, how do we get out of our bubble? What, are, what, are, what does our friend circle look like? What is our experience with people from different religions? Uh, and sort of how we mix it up culturally. And that's sort of happening whether you want to or not because we're becoming a much more diverse uh, culture. But the third level is how we tackle it on a personal level how we engage in it on a, you know, on a very micro level. And there's sort of two parts of that. One is how we interrupt it when we hear it. You know, someone's, someone, because I'm white, somebody might say something racist, what do I do? Because I'm male, somebody might say something sexist, what do I do? But also the reflective piece. And, that, and that's sort of what you're speaking to is that that yeah. sort of level, like how we engage in it in ourselves. And it, this is, you know, not to be overly Freudian about the subconscious and the superego and ego, but you know, our ego is, anybody that's been in a relationship can know that your ego can get in the way. <laughs> you can be your own worst enemy. Like anybody who's been in an LTR has had like, oh, why do I keep shooting myself in the foot? Well, you know, we, we you know, have to have those moments of reflection around these things because we get very defensive. We want to fight. We want to defend ourselves. We want to prove that we're good people. And there is uh, time to sit with that discomfort. There is time to kind of reflect on how we became who we became. I mean, one of the things that I, I, I think is, a, I, and I don't know where this came from, but it just, this, this sort of example came across uh, my consciousness years ago, and I've been using it ever since. It's somebody who is an alcoholic, um, who struggles with alcoholism, can go for years without a drink, right? They can be dry uh, and sober for 20 years, and you will not hear them say, I am no longer an alcoholic, I've been cured, right? They are forever an alcoholic, and there, but for the grace of God, you know, one day at a time, they're dealing with it. Well, these biases are so deeply woven in us. We're never free of them. I'm never going to say I'm not a racist. I'm anti-racist, but I am racist. I learned, ra I grew up in Stone Mountain. I grew up in America. I grew up, you know, in this world that values white people at a higher level. And I internalize that. I internalize sexism. I internalize homophobia, ableism. I mean, sort of all these things are woven into me way in the back of my head that implicit bias stuff. And so I have to have an honest conversation with myself uh, and, and get away from the denial. Because I think that the normal position is we want to fight. No, I'm a good person, I'm a good person. And we put up all these, you know, these things like, well, you know, I have black friends or my stepson in Puerto Rican, or I voted for Obama, or I marched in the 60s, or I have a Beyonce record. Like, you know, don't judge me as a, stop doing that, stop doing that. The first part of this is to have, and, and say it's all of us including people of color have internalized a lot of these messages too. I mean, the people that I study, I'm going to stop talking in a second, but the people that no, I no, study, no. That's what you're supposed to do. I study white supremacists who I would argue 
it technically should is everybody will say things like well black people can be racist too and they're trying to make the reverse racism argument like being angry at racist white people is racism but what what we know from the research is that uh, yeah black people can be racist towards black people because they've internalized the same messages about white supremacy that everybody right. else has you know we have we have a shade a colorism as we're calling it now you know the lighter the lighter skinned minority is going to get more attention because they look yeah. more, you know, like the white people. Um, I had, a, I was doing an interview, I, I, I flown to New York to do an interview at CBS with a, a really great uh, female newscaster there who's an African American and one of my African American friends in Portland saw it who's darker skinned, her, her tone is darker and she's like, oh yeah, they love those light skinned black women on TV. And I was like, I never even thought about that, but that's how yeah. she sees you know, white, white supremacy internalized within the black community. So, um, yeah. so anyway, the, 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 that was a little bit of a runaround. But the answer is that we start having these conversations with ourselves and try not to be so fragile as the term is, uh, and yeah. defensive, uh, and be able to sit with our discomfort. Uh, and that's really the first step to this whole thing, I think. The micro- yeah. Acknowledging that we're wired this way and we can't unwire. Right. right. It's and I was having this conversation with somebody and, and you just mentioned, you know, growing up in Stone Mountain. Um, if the Klan was a thing and is a thing, there are a lot of us who have family members that were in it. A lot of white people that have family members that were in it, they didn't know. Yeah. Right. And so it's like we we do put on that. I think it's called perception management or, or something like that, where we say the blue lies. Right. Like we say what sounds right and how we want to be seen. And then we come into direct conflict with the reality that, like, for me, my grandfather was in the Klan. I found this out about three years ago. I never met the man. He was dead when I was born. But it's like you start to realize, yeah, this is a deeper, deeper issue. And the amazing thing is we were never able to have these conversations before. It's, I mean, for, for the tragedy of George Floyd's murder and all of the murders and, and everything that's come up, we're now able to have these conversations in a different light. And I guess that's also one of the things I'm, I'm curious about. Right now, um, we have a moment in history with heightened awareness and a new level of honesty, a new level of transparency. Do you personally, with all of your background, think we'll take advantage to move things forward? Or are we going to fall back into some level of comfort and denial? Yeah. It's a, it's a really important question, and I think to borrow from our friend Malcolm Gladwell, we are at a tipping point um, yeah. because of the demographic shift in this country. Uh, we know from the projections that the 2050 census will show that America, by you know, in a very short 30-year period, will be a, ma a majority minority country. That the piece of the pie that's white people will be smaller than the non-white people. So that change is uh, is a reality. Uh, we are becoming a browner nation, which I think is a good thing. Uh, and uh, and so we're, you know, it's kind of like which side are, I mean, I think that NASCAR uh, is sort of the canary in the coal mine. If NASCAR can ban the Confederate flag, it means re there's real change happening. There's some momentum behind this change. I think it's happening uh, among young people. Uh, the millennial and the post-millennial generation are incredibly diverse. The, the, the millennial generation is bigger than the baby boom generation. And it is much browner. It's much more immigrant, uh, and so those those changes will will kind of happen. But the, 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 I think the question is: I mean, we're having these important conversations. The George Floyd thing. The the thing. The, the parallel I make with George Floyd is um, the way that white people experienced the world when they turned on the CBS Evening News in 1966 and saw people, civil rights marchers, including white people, but mostly black people in Selma, Alabama being beaten and having dogs, you know, uh, attack, attack them, the sort of wake up call. There was this great study that came out from this guy at Columbia University in the end of the 60s, Ken Keniston, who was trying to understand what, what the hell is happening? <laughs> Why are all my students marching in the street? What is all this about? And he did this great study. It was this book called On Being Radical. He found out that when people are aware of their values, they, they value fairness, and then you show them the world and say, that's not fair, right? You, you kind of slap them in the face with the reality and show how contrary it is to their values a lot of those people will engage to try to get things to where they think 
uh, would be in line with their values. And I think the thing with George Floyd is that, you know, that murder was so uh, unambiguous. There was no chance that he had a gun or he was resisting arrest or anything, you know, for nine minutes, you know, this man is calling out for his mother saying, I can't breathe. And it's just, there's just no ambiguity about it. It was a, it was a state sanctioned execution, you know, in, in that lens. And so it, it like those images that, that white people saw in the sixties, you just, they tried. I mean, I have people in my circle that immediately wanted to attack the victim. George Floyd had a criminal record. You know, he shouldn't have blah, blah, blah. Um, I mean, it's just amazing. I was just doing screenshots. A lot of my friends from Stone Mountain who immediately were attacking George Floyd. That's still there. But there is this overwhelming awareness of like, wow. I was unsure about Ferguson because I didn't really, you know, see it too clearly. But this I can see clearly and I can see what, what, what people are upset about. So I, I you know, to be hopeful. There's a lot of things going on. I mean, the economy tanking, the COVID issue, the kind of uh, political division that's happening in the Trump era, you know, all that sort of all coming together. And also this huge millennial generation that is now a massive voting block um, makes me think, I mean, my, my little mantra that this past month has been that 2020 is gonna make 1968 look like 1954. <laughs> Of course, 1968 gave us President Richard Nixon, so I should like not use that metaphor too much because, you know, there could be the backlash. But it feels like, as someone who's been doing this work a long time, people, uh, white people. See, I, that, I just did it. I just did a little thing called normative whiteness there when I'm talking about white people, and I say people. Uh, it's like when yeah. I you know, assume everything is male. Um, that uh, that white people uh, are more interested in having this conversation about race. I mean, the white fragility book has been, you know, selling like hotcakes because white people are trying to figure out how to engage in this issue. Um, yeah. So I, I you know, there, yeah. it feels like we're in a moment. It feels like we're in a moment that could become a movement. Well, I want to talk about uh, or touch on something you just mentioned. And this again gets back to the book uh, where we do, we categorize things like that. That's how our brains are able to work quickly, we throw things into categories and we make determinations and somebody walks past us and we're immediately judging them and putting them into some context we know. Like the concept of mind bugs where if we don't have all the information, we kind of bridge that gap, we just make it up, right? And then that becomes like kind of a truth. And one of the interesting things uh, was this concept that when you say American, you think white male, right? right? And that's why we say African American. And that's why we say Asian American because American is a white term, but only because that's the way we've been conditioned to hear it. So do those things ever change or is that just something that exists? Well, yeah, of course they change, but they take time because the term sociologists use is socialization. We're socialized uh, to understand what is normal. I have to do a lot of air quotes in my line of work because what is normal is <laughs> constantly uh, you know, being constructed and reconstructed. And so if you grow up, you know, if you grow up in Saudi Arabia, you have a different normal than if you grow up in Stone Mountain. I saw we had someone here from Stone Mountain, which is nice. Yeah, um, fine. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, you're, what you kind of inter internalize, I mean, I think growing up in Portland, there's a different person. Portland is a very, for people who don't know, Portland is a very white city. I got here from Atlanta yeah. and I thought it was a Twilight Zone episode. I got on a bus and it was all white people. And I thought, what? where's Rod Serling? Um, you were being taken to a place in the Twilight Zone. The, um, and so, you know, your environment has a lot to do with uh, your notion of normality, but your environment in, in our world includes the media. Like you can raise your kid to be the most woke kid ever. And they're, you know, they're still getting the world around us. My, my five-year-old, I've noticed, uh, sees race and she's seen that white is normal. Uh, and we've we realized, I'm like, oh my God, I think it would be pretty uh, bad if I was r raising a white supremacist. So we need to get in front of this. How do I interrupt this and have some conversation with her? And so she's, you know, all plugged into Black Lives Matter now. She was at March a couple days ago. Uh, but, you know, it, a, a few months ago, we were watching the family feud and there was a black family and a white family and she was rooting for the white family. And I, and I said, you know, why? <laughs> why do you want the white family to win? And she didn't have the language to, 
to be able to express it, but she had already internalized this notion that white is the normal and non-white is sort of the other thing that comes into the scene. And I thought, oh my God, you know, yeah. it's not going to be good for my my line of work as an anti-bias trainer, for my <laughs> kids, you know, like rooting for white people. And, I, you know, I, I think she started to figure that out now because we've been talking to her a lot about George Floyd and, and, and Breonna Taylor and, um, I mean, she understands that there's imbalance and unfairness in the world, which is sad to like lay on a five-year-old. But, um, but it was clear that she was taking in the world, despite, you know, our environment of, you know, being a very pro. I mean, she's a biracial child. My, my, my wife is Mexican. Uh, but um, she's internalizing the world that she's in. And we do that and it goes right to the back of the head. Uh, and then we don't see it. So I, I want to get. Um, I, I hope I'm not like studying her someday. Like, hey, honey, can I come to uh, the fun rally with you? I know I want to well, do some. <laughs> I just want to say, you know, my dad was a child psychologist, and my brother is a scientist and atheist. My sister was a minister for a long time who lost her faith, and I've always been agnostic. So it's like, so so do keep an eye on that. Yes. <laughs> make, make sure you're not accidentally. Well, you know, they always say like your kids turn out the exact opposite of you. So that's what I'm yeah. worried about. Like, you know, she's going to become a super right wing <laughs> evangelical street preacher. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I hope not. Um, let's get to uh, one of our questions. Everybody, we do have the Q&A open. So feel free to uh, throw questions over there. We'll also keep an eye on the chat. Um, the first one's coming to us from a good friend, Al Emmerich, here in Jacksonville. Uh, with so many white people struggling to view their role in systemic racism, how have you bridged the natural defensiveness yeah. which occurs when initiating discussion? Oh man, I'm so glad this is the first question that comes in. So let me let me tell you, let me tell you, let me. Th th this is a complex problem with complex solutions and complex ways of talking about it. But um, the, the important, I think the most important thing that I've heard over the past two weeks with these protests uh, is the use of the word trauma. The, tra the word trauma is being used. And one of the things that I've seen uh, at least two or three times in the mainstream media is grown black men talking about George Floyd and breaking into tears because what is it gonna take to change things? And that cumulative trauma of being black in America is so overwhelming that in 2020, we're still dealing with this. So the, 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 since we all have the, the capacity to be empathetic, since we all have the capacity to be good kind of caring people, um, if we understand the trauma that is created by bias, and sometimes it's by overt acts, like the murder of a black man by police officers, but sometimes it's just little microaggressions. It's little saying things like, oh, you're well dressed for, or, or um, I mean, my wife, who I mentioned is Mexican, mentioned uh, to me one day that it's, it's hard for her living in a neighborhood where there aren't any people like her that understand her culture that right. you know, live in a predominantly white and African-American neighborhood. And she doesn't have anybody that affirms her background, that that is just a little, you know, it's not being beaten by a cop, but it's just another little reminder that you're on the outsider. So when we start understanding the nature of trauma and the cumulative impact on trauma, I had a lot of white Stone Mountain folks on Facebook say, well, they arrested those cops. Why are, why are people so angry? You know, what is done? When they arrested that cop and did it. I'm like, it's not George Floyd, it's a thousand George Floyds. And it's what yeah. that trauma uh, creates in people's mindsets, both internally and externally. And if we start sort of seeing that, I think it's a way to, for us white people to be like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize. I didn't realize by saying I'm colorblind, I'm actually hurting people. You yeah. know, they're, they're playing the race card. You know, you, you, white people have the privilege of not being a race. Uh, and but people of color don't. So to be able to have that conversation, there was a there was a great. I've been assigning white privilege this term. Um, where Robin D'Angelo, who does these uh, trainings, uh, was talking uh, to a sort of a mixed group of people uh, and about how white people get so defensive, right? So defensive, like I don't know, and it's not me. I can't say anything right. I'm just going to shut down. And and she asked this African American man. I think to me this was like the moment in the book. What would it be like to be able to talk to white people about your experience being black and have them just listen? And his answer was, it would be revolutionary. For me to be able to <laughs> tell you, this is what it's like to be black in America in 2020. And for this white person to sit and listen 
and not try to say, well, that's not me, or things are so much better, or you could be in Africa, or um, uh, would just to, just to get us to listen and to hear the trauma. Um, I think that's the the route to empathy, and that's that's when it all of a sudden everything starts to change. And I know as a white person who's been doing this work for a long time, I can get really defensive. I mean, like, well, I was undercover yeah, yeah. studying skinheads. Don't say I'm racist or, you know, I'm guilty yeah. of it like everyone else. But when I s stop centering myself, this is the terminology we use. Like, you know, so it's all about me. There's a great section in the book called White Women's Tears about how, like, when w w white women start crying because they feel like, you know, they're being accused of being racist, then it's all about that white woman instead of the trauma that her racism might be causing, you know, they, it's right. all, you mean, I, I have to learn, this is where, 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 you know, I get paid to talk, but this is where I have to shut up, where I um, uh, have to, have to listen and hear other people's stories and just sit with it and not try to say, well, that's not me. You know, I'm one of the good people just to sit with yep. it, and to hear that and to hear how widespread that trauma is. Um, I think that is, that's a very long answer to a very good question, but to, no. be able to, to build that on that empathy by thinking about the notion of trauma. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, something you just touched on, and uh, I'd mentioned Project Ink Black quite a few times. A lot of people in the community know them, uh, Boywin and Jahan, who have coached us uh, through different things. We were having a call today, and I just mentioned how I've had to change a lot of my inputs um, because even people I followed who I think were aligned in terms of what we would like to see happen in the world, they're so angry uh, that it shuts me down. Yeah. And so in order for me to stay motivated and get out of that excuse mentality of I can't do anything right, <laughs> I've taken it upon myself to make sure that my inputs aren't just an echo chamber, right? I'm still getting pushed and I'm still learning, but I'm also not feeling like I, I'm not people, I'm not surrounding myself with people who are punching wildly all over. I'm, I'm looking for people who are still punching up, yeah. you know, who are still trying to make a difference. Well, and part of this is just the simple, uh, the simple recognition that we're not, we're not done. <laughs> There's a country music song that says yeah. I'm a work in progress, which is something that I tell my yeah. wife on a regular basis. So, you know, we're all <laughs> works in progress. So let's get to work. Um, and to yeah. not think that I, I've got it all figured out. I got, you know, I, I voted for Obama, so I'm good. Uh, yeah. you know, that somehow I'm on this side. And that's, you know, that's the binary that we talk about. And the gender is even a bigger one. I mean, we talk, we can talk about trauma associated with gender. I do um, some CLE trainings with lawyers and I've had so many female attorneys say, you know, the impact of showing up at a, again at a deposition and being thought that I was the secretary or the note taker or the translator. I'm like, no, I'm the attorney. Like that, there's a cumulative impact of that. And so for us to sort of understand that we're, we're all part of this process, like just the language yeah. that we uh, use. I had a student uh, this week tell me about, uh, who's autistic, uh, use the term neurodivergent. She said, you know, don't refer to me as disabled, I'm neurodivergent. And I'm like, okay, there's a new term for me to incorporate. Um, yep. And so we're, you know, we're constantly on this process and you have to, and, and the beauty of that is you give yourself permission to be wrong. Like nobody's got it perfectly figured out. I had a, I had a student, this term to say, how come we say people of color, but can't say colored people? I'm like, all right, let's talk about that. You let's know, talk we, about the history we, of it, yeah. We want to learn to defer to people how they want to be referred to as. Um, right. And so there, th that's a process and, the pro and part of that process is, and this is, gets to the us versus them thing in the book, is breaking through the binary you know it's not those people over there and us over here it's just us and we're all yeah. figuring this out together but we're also figuring out how to do it with being less traumatizing and harmful and and acknowledging the history of hurt that's there uh and so we're, we're on this journey and that makes it exciting it makes it exciting yeah. not, i don't come in as the expert i come in as someone who is on this journey and we're all on this journey together and it's it's cool because all of a sudden my world is widening you know, when yeah. I, I, mean, I have so much ableism, I've been drinking a lot of coffee taking down. <laughs> I stayed up so late watching 90 Day Fiance that I've just been power drinking the coffee. So just feel <laughs> free to shut me down, Carl. Um, no, you're great. Um, I, I was, yeah, I was gonna say like my knowledge about how ableist I am. You know, when I say, oh, you should walk a mile in my shoes. Well, you know, lots of people don't walk. <laughs> it's just something as simple as that, yeah. you know, is an ableist statement. So. Um, 
So, you know, the, be, when, once you put yourself on that journey of I'm evolving and I'm learning all this stuff, it's, I think it's awesome. Yeah, it means yeah. I'm like no longer the king of the hill, but let's talk about why I was king of the hill in the first place, right? There was like exactly. 400 years and a thousand years and 10,000, you know. There's a long there's a long history of oppression that put me on the top of the hill. So uh, I'm enjoying sliding down that hill. There you go. Sliding is fun, right? I mean, when we're kids, we love to go when, down. When the we were kids, we did it all the time. Exactly. Well, and then suddenly, we just want to stay up top. It's nah. not that great up there. Uh, let's see, Ashley Kritzer. Hey, Ashley, glad that you're here. Um, do you think the uprising that we're seeing is partly related to the timing of COVID-19 pandemic? In other words, if we weren't in a pandemic the uprising wouldn't be so loud and this is a great question because yeah and there's a couple home, pieces to that yeah Go so ahead. i mean the first thing that pops in my head is one of the things that became really clear early on is the covid had a disproportionate impact on people of color and it was very yeah. clear I mean, the work that i do as a hate crime person hate, a person who studies hate crimes not committing hate crimes uh <laughs> is the, the, the well they're still your daughter we yeah. gotta wait and see <laughs> don't encourage her yes, you were. um that uh that you know we saw asian americans being targeted uh at, as you know the source of the wuhan virus and all that stuff. right um, and then and then when the data came in about who was being affected you know the frontline workers are disproportionately bl black and brown people uh Absolutely. were getting at a higher rate so it really revealed the the racial imbalance with regards to health inequities uh and then on top of that another like very, very, um, very powerful uh, killing of a black man by police officers. And, and added to the fact that, you know, not only is the impact killing African-Americans at a higher rate, but it's also throwing them out of work. So, I mean, it's sort of a perfect, perfect or, you know, perfect storm. I mean, all these things coming together. So I think it's definitely a factor. I don't, I, 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 you know, I mean, we'll have to do the analysis and the surveys to figure out the, the, the right. reality down the road. But it seems like all this added to the desire to people yeah. get out. And of course, one of the things, and then also part of this has been the anti-lockdown protests that have been infiltrated by white supremacists. The contrast, you know, guys with yeah. their guns who are, you know, and everybody's saying, well, if a black person marched on the state capitol with a gun, they'd be dead. <laughs> You know, yeah. so it, it's just, we've had a lesson. I mean, it's sort of a great time to be a sociologist because, you know, day after day, we have a lesson about these inequities in our society. And I think it just became too clear for people to see, um, um, you know, that this isn't still a problem in yeah. 2020. So what, one other thing around COVID-19 was, it, as much as it showed that disparity, um, it also made us all kind of worldwide go through the same thing at the same time. That was just one thing yeah. I know. It's like, okay, we're all dealing with a problem at the same time. So d does that also kind of level us a little while we're looking? Yeah, I mean, there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it. Is has touched everyone uh, in in a, in a certain way, um, and it just shows you how quickly. I mean, there, there's all this going on, but it it, it also right. shows you how quickly society can change when it wants to. I mean, one of the things yeah. we talk about is how in World War II you know, immediately we developed a, a national uh, daycare system that we had, you know, every, every kid, uh, you know, whose mom or dad was working in the ship factory was in a federal daycare and there was housing built overnight. We had this incredible amount of housing like that, like the country changed on a dime because we were in a war mode. And so we've seen also a version of that now, how quickly things changed. Uh, when we need to, we, you know, the whole, seems like the whole government is r relatively on the same page, relatively, about, you know, the yeah. value of shutting down. And, and so there is also the, the frustration, well, gee, when we, when, you know, when something like this happens, what? We, it just happens, it just changes. We don't have to argue about it. We, the change, you know, the will is there to get it done. So why around some of these other issues isn't the will there to get those changes done? And I and, and and it's I think part of it, like the 1960s, it sort of put everybody in front of the television, uh, and right. so we've been we've been plugged in. Whether it's their laptop or their phone or their you know flat screen TV, right. you know, all of a sudden we're kind of plugged in. And once we got past Tiger King, you know, we started saying, "Hey, what's going on in the world? <laughs> My gosh!" Um, and so I was only yeah, four I, episodes in, so I don't know that I'm going no, back. 
really, I'm so nostalgic for the Tiger King days. It was such a simpler time then. <laughs> it was a simpler time. It was a day. <laughs> We're going to uh, take a turn and look in Honolulu's direction. Hey, Alan Ritari, nice to have you back in the flow. Um, how do we connect all this to our work and team, especially for those who compartmentalize work versus life and don't see any relevance? Ooh, how do we, uh, um, hmm. How, so I, can, I can go a little deeper on this. Uh, Alan yeah, was on please. a call that we had on Monday, and uh, a lot of us were talking about how we talk with our teams about what's going on with racial injustice and the company. Do we make a statement? Do we not make a statement? Mm, if we do, what it. is that? And he had a team member who said, I don't understand why we're doing this. We build websites. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, that, so this is, when we talk about a systemic problem, uh, it isn't one system. It isn't policing or it isn't government or isn't, you know, it is in all systems because all systems are populated by people <laughs> and all those people internalize the same uh, messages about the world. And so we can find inequity, uh, issues in all systems, uh, including the way we design things. So, you know, a lot of the work I do with the state of Oregon is about, you know, getting uh, hate crime law information to the people. And one of the things that we have to think about is we always just assume everybody speaks English, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and there, are, and as a native, native English speaker, I don't think, wow, there might be some people that are speaking, you know, languages that I, I've never heard of. So maybe I, I, I should think about that a little bit. So part of this right. is to, again, the, the reflective piece about how my biases are coming into play here. How am I reproducing a system that looks like me that might block people out? And the, when we talk about equity, equity is such a, you know, for the last like two or three years has been such a buzzword. I wish I had a little bell that then comes And a polarizing <laughs> buzzword too. Yeah, right. Is, you know, a lot of people think equity is like hanging up a, a sign that says, you know, we don't discriminate, you know, come join our team. But there are also a lot of people that don't know your team even exists. Uh, you know, we want to invite people to the table, but a lot of people don't know the table even exists or have been sort of not allowed at the tables. So we're like, why do I want to go sit at that table? So there, that means right. there's outreach that you want to go out and find out what voices are not represented in the conversation and might need to be. We had an experience here in Portland where we had a lot of urban renewal in this city and it usually meant the displacement of people of color. We built a highway right through the black neighborhood. We built a stadium right in the black neighborhood. We expanded the hospital. You know, they used to call it, this is a James Baldwin quote, the urban renewal urban renewal is Negro removal, that they would just sort of find the black neighborhood and that's where all the new projects were. And so the city finally figured it out, right? We've got this horrible racist history here in Portland and they wanted to sort of recreate this building called the Hill Block Building in the black neighborhood and uh, to sort of do some reparations, to repair some of the damage done in the past. And so they started planning it and they didn't think to initially invite the people of color to the table to see if they even wanted the damn building built uh, because they were trying to do good work this is very Portland, oh. without thinking well maybe we should talk i mean they, they've fixed it since My then heart. they have a like a little commission it includes the people from the neighborhood and people of color but the initial impulse was we got we white people know best we did this bad thing so we're going to go do this good thing and not think about how do we bring people into this team who this is gonna affect more directly? Um, and I, so I think on that question is, first of all, anything that you're doing to move the ball of true equity around these issues is a good thing. If you could you know, be a, a, a two person you know, bagel shop, uh, and, you know, dealing with these issues is gonna be important. But also, you know, equity is an action plan. You have to go out and, and bring people in to the conversation. Uh, which requires a little bit of work. And that's why, you know, a lot of people are like, huh, you know, I got yeah. a couple more episodes of the Tiger King. I'd like to go out and do some, uh, you know, community yep. recruitment, but you know, too much yeah. work. That's why you hear so many people saying do the work. Yeah. Right. And, and can I just say something about that? You know, this is the, the, a lot of this is work. Like being a, a white person confronting racism is hard. Being a male person uh, that has to deal with sexism is hard. But you know what? Being a person of color is a lot harder. And being a female in America is a lot harder. And so, yeah. you know, the fact that we're like, oh my God, I wrote this whole piece because I was having like a fragile moment on my blog about like the, the fatigue <laughs> of being a progressive or, you know, like, oh, poor me. I just, I should have gone, all my friends yeah. at Emory went to law school and, or on Wall Street and what am I doing? Like I should have done, you know. Um, 
come on. I mean, the experience, I mean, look, think about George Floyd's family, right? That is, that is the experience of being a person of color in America. Uh, and so yeah. for me to f have to go out and do some, do some work, you know, or do some work on myself, why, I, shut up, Randy, just do it. <laughs> I want to get to uh, another question that's that's around the workplace, and this is around hiring bias. Mm -hmm. um, the book talks a little bit about um, when Symphony started doing blind auditions and how that increased the number of women musicians that okay. were in orchestras and things like that. Um, the question, uh, a little backstory, they said, we've started to put safeguards in place like work first and some blind resume work, but I'd really love to hear what's the most effective uh, and as you start to diversify, how do you ensure your new hires don't feel tokenized? Yeah. And that's a whole nother book. Right? Yeah, there's two questions there. I mean, the first is on the hiring yeah. itself. Um, I mean, this is where, first of all, we have to have a real uh, clear idea that we have implicit bias, uh, that we have unconscious. I mean, I've been on a lot of university hiring committees and we get down to three qualified candidates. And I know in my head, when I'm thinking who of those three I'm going to pick, I, my thought is, oh, this person I'd like to have a beer with. I can imagine hanging out with this person. I never do have a beer with that person, but I kind of have this notion. That, and, and what I'm doing is saying, they're sort of like me. I'd like to ha get to know them better. And therefore I'm excluding the people that aren't like me. So to be able aware, aware of where implicit bias is at work, um, it just it, to be really clear about that and try to interrupt it because that's you know we're interrupting ourselves it's like therapy right. here. like oh, i've been doing this for years i got to stop doing this uh so to be able to interrupt that it, it, that, that bias um you know in in those hot spots i mean we work with law enforcement right and they're they're sometimes their implicit bias can be life or death am, am i going to shoot this guy or not if i right. read black as threat I'm more likely to pull the trigger. So I have to think if I'm right. going into a situation where I'm gonna have my gun drawn, am I gonna be working on the, you know, the <sighs> lizard brain that says black equals threat. So so that part about being being really clear about decision making points where where implicit bias might be at work is really important. Right. Um, the thing about the hiring thing, though, is a whole nother challenge. I mean, we have a huge issue here in the Pacific Northwest, especially in Portland, about wanting to recruit minority candidates for job positions into a place where, guess what? They're not going to feel very welcome. You know, I'm going to invite, uh, I want to hire an African-American, uh, you know, manager to work at my sports shoe company who's coming with his family. And, you know, he's going to, he's got a son who's going to be 16 year old. 16 years old in a year and is going to be driving around this environment where and so there that notion of being tokenized is kind of you're sort of a um and I've, I've worked with a black urban league that has like a really good perspective on this which is don't be afraid to see their color the problem is we want to be colorblind and therefore you know we think that we're woke and we're not judging them by the color of their skin or the content of their character. I mean, we've taken that quote from Dr. King out of context so much. Yeah. Is that, that we need to link those people up with, with community, uh, with right. people who are like them, who, you know, if they're Cambodian, who know where the good Cambodian grocery store is, uh, and to connect those people to, to see their color. Because I think that you know, we're, afraid, we're afraid that if we see their color, we're being racist. Uh, right. And there, they have to see color. They have to think: Am I going to feel safe here? Am I, is my family going to feel, feel welcome? Is there a church like my church that I can live near? So we, you know, have to have a strategy by which those people, and it could be, you know, a minority uh, employee, you know, club or something. Right. It could be something that's institutionalized within the institution to be um, to to see color. Because we've been trained not to see color, which is a lie. Yeah. We always see color. But to be able to see color, to help those people um, be able to figure out if they're going to be safe and what their community is going to be when, once they're hired. It's, it yeah. seems it's counter to like what we've been taught. Like, don't talk it's, about race. It goes against everything we've been taught. Yeah. I mean, it, and I, I think it was Trevor Noah in one of the videos he put out where he was talking about white people are the, the only race that doesn't talk about race. Yeah. It's right. like, if, if you're, if you're somewhere else, it, and he was talking about a black conversation where somebody says, well, Frank's coming by, well, black Frank or Chinese Frank, or Chinese Frank, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, just totally normal. Right. Whereas if, if that happened in a white conversation, and maybe that changes over time, but we'd be like, oh my God, I can't believe he said it that way. Why don't you just say his last name? You know, it's like, uh, so, so that's another thing. We've been, from the beginning, 
just not having the conversation and we're, we're catching up for me much later in life, right? Like that we're yeah. getting here. So um, I want to go ahead. Uh, let's see. We've got a question here from Wayne, who is our friend in Stone Mountain. Uh, boots on the ground. How does, how do we communicate? Okay, I'm trying to make sure I got this right. How does communicate that they come from a place of open vulnerability and make it clear that we're open? Probably going to screw it up via micro behaviors, but intentions are good. What's the conversational language? I yeah. hope I got that right. Yeah, no, I no, I get, I get it. I mean, there is again. I mean, we're on this sort of road, and so to be able to have this process uh, of honesty, you know, to be vulnerable. I think, especially for men, we're not supposed to be vulnerable. Uh, or, or get things wrong. I mean, whoever invented like Google Maps, I'm sure it was a dude who never wanted to have to ask for directions again, you know, map quests. Like nobody, I tell my students like, you know, men don't ask for directions. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's just on your phone. Um, that, uh, you know, we're not, we're not, we're supposed to kind of know it all and be in this position of authority. And so just to, you know, to, to be, to acknowledge our, um, I, here's another term that, that we throw around a lot is that, you know, ignorant, you're being ignorant is bad. You know, you're, you're ignorant. We're all ignorant. I mean, you always don't know more than you know, right? I, there's all kinds, I don't know how to speak Swahili or make a souffle. Like there's lots of things that I don't know about. Um, so, you know, to, to be okay with the ignorance and be on that sort of learning process uh, to start having those, those conversations. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it, but we also have to normalize that because we normalize our defensiveness and I know everything. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, this is the the folks that we get on in the news, you know, who are just, I know everything. I, you never see anybody on CNN or Fox or whatever say, I don't know. I mean, I just, I'm anxious to learn, but everybody comes from the voice of authority. They have their pen in their hand, always, you know, the prop to show that they know what they're talking about. Um, to be able to say, look, we don't, we don't really know. Let's, let's, let's learn together. Um, yeah. And if we, if that was more common than the sort of, everybody is kind of an expert, um, and with the definitive answer on everything. I mean, I love, yeah. there's a great quote from Joseph Campbell about religion, which is, I think, so applicable to everything. He says, he that thinks he knows, doesn't know. He that knows he doesn't know, knows. And of course, it's <laughs> completely gender biased. He should have said, you know, someone, but you right. know, he's an old, old white guy. But, you know, that notion of being okay so, with not knowing. He um, probably didn't know. He didn't know, he didn't know. So he, didn't know that he didn't say he. That's Just right. People. All right, let's see. Katie Palmer. Thank you, Katie, for this question. With tech not truly being an equalizer and blacks making up less than 5% of the workforce in places like Silicon Valley, for those of us doing the DNI work and bringing in more uh, black and IPOC into our workforce, how do we ensure that there isn't that feeling of tokenism? So we're back, back to yeah. tokenism. I mean, again, it's just this honest conversation about race uh, and to give yeah. people, um, uh, and it could it also could go with regards to disability or for sexual orientation. I mean, trans people get tokenized and gay people right. get tokenized. Um, to, to have a, to be able to know that there's a safe space and that people are, are can have an honest desire to create uh, an equitable place where everyone is heard. There is a study that came out that said that people in the workplace who feel they can be to totally who they are, with, whether it's their religion or their sexual orientation or their race, are 4.5 times more productive in the workforce. <laughs> I'm not sure how they measured this, but you know, that when people <laughs> feel like they can, they don't have to, I, I do a lot of trainings with federal workers and sometimes they'll say, yeah, I can't talk about my religion or I can't talk about being a black man here, or I can't talk about being a lesbian here, I have to just leave that at home. And that when people can be who they are, they are more productive. So from a purely capitalist perspective to get, you know, right. the worker bees to be more productive, when people have, I feel like they, they don't have to hide an element of their personality and that it is welcome there and celebrated without being tokenized, but we're, you know, that, that we, we value, I mean, we know that biodiversity makes things healthier. Right? We have an irregular heartbeat, yeah. uh, and so we need that. We need that sort of mix of ideas and backgrounds. And so when those people are valued but can feel uh, that that, safe, that space is safe and doesn't require them to sort of not talk about something, um, yeah. 
so and, and there are ways of doing that that are that are inclusive including just just uh, uh, having those honest conversations about these issues uh and so you know when i go in and do trainings i often have people of color say oh my god thank you or i have you know queer people say oh my god thank you because no i have i've felt like i've been suffocated because i i'm not allowed to be who i am in this space and thank you for giving me permission to be here and encouraging my yeah. workmates to see me uh, uh, and not be afraid to ad address these issues. So I get having yeah. these conversations. I think that that's excellent advice. And it, it actually brings up something from uh, Daniel Pink's book, Drive, where he talks about when we feel like we're treated fairly extrinsically, then we can focus intrinsically. So yeah. it's like when, when, that, when that external environment is no longer something I have to keep my eye on because I trust it, right? Then I can become a real part of this. Um, another thing that's come up a few times in the community that I, I think is to your question a little bit, Katie, is just this understanding that culture's got to change if you're going to bring in people uh, that are different than the culture you have. Um, and, and you have to make room for that and you have to plan for that uh, because otherwise nobody's going to stay for very long. If, if they don't get a chance to be a part of what's happening. So. Yeah, and having, you know, one of the phrases that we've been using is having, you know, it used to be the courageous conversations, but having uncomfortable conversations and being okay with yeah. that. You know, being willing to not know, like Joseph Campbell, being willing to say, hey, you know, yeah. what, what's the best, you know, what, we have a, a, you've hired a person who's a transgender person. Hey, let's have a conversation about this. I mean, how do you feel about, you know, the restroom issue here at work? Or, or you know, let's just, let's yeah. just deal with it head on. Um, and that way that person's like, wow, they, they take my issue seriously. They see me. And um, I know it's difficult because we get very defensive and fragile. I mean, I think part of the problem, especially with regards to race, is just that white people don't want to talk about it. You know, yeah. so let's, let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And it's going to be yeah. awkward and weird, but I think it'll be appreciated. <laughs> awkward and weird. Yeah. That's my high school yeah, that, career. <laughs> that permission. <laughs> um, a, a friend of mine who grew up in Jacks, Willie Jackson, he's in Oakland now uh, doing a lot of uh, consulting around racial justice and uh, diversity. And one of the things he said um, was that it's totally fine if you want to have your company stay the same. If you're a small company and you're all white and all those things, he's like, that's fine. Just don't act like you want to change. Mm -hmm. Like, don't, don't put things on the website or don't do different things. Just say, okay, this is who we're going to be. He said, I personally think you're going to have a real issue with finding talent in the yeah. long run. <laughs> um, but, it, but it's one of those things I think also is that, you, again, back to do the work. It's not enough to interview more people that aren't like your current team. It's not enough to bring in more people that aren't like your current team. You have to change your current team. Like it, it has to really yeah. be different. Hey, hey I, uh, Carl, I see this comment on the uh, side of the question from Al about crime and poverty statistics. Yeah. Um, I just, I, that is just something that comes up a lot in sociology. So I wanted to address that Go really quickly, it. which is, uh, you know, Mark Twain once said there are lies, damn lies and statistics. So you can yeah. use those statistics out of context to tell any kind of story that you want. Ask Donald Trump about the polls and he'll tell you the polls are all wrong, <laughs> right? So um, so the, all those uh, statistics need to be in, in context. More white people commit crimes, but we have a lot of police presence in black neighborhoods. So you're gonna get more arrests in black Absolutely. neighborhoods. And so there are ways of sort of explaining those in context. And so you can, t you can throw any statistic out there in the world. Um, to, under, to make your case. And so I think understanding those things about what drives the poverty rate, what drives the crime rate, um, uh, are, are things that you should take a sociology class to learn about. <laughs> you know, th th those those uh, statistics have to be understood in context. So just quote Mark Twain at right. him. That'll shut him down. <laughs> there you go. Let's get to uh, Patricia's question. Um, Patricia says, white culture is the culture of how people are expected to act in a workplace for the most part. I've been trying to figure out how to get my workplace to understand that we need to be culturally more inclusive so that black people can walk into our organization every day and not have to leave their culture behind. Yeah. Thoughts on how we do this? Well, um, there is a bumper sticker that says celebrate diversity. Uh, and, you know, I always think the shortcut is always food, like people, you, you uh, get to people through their, 
you know, I don't like Chinese people. Well, I saw you eating Chinese food. Oh, I like those Chinese people. So, you know, I mean, understanding the contribution that, that different groups make to our culture is sort of the way in. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing because it is about changing culture and what is the normal culture. Um, and so part of that, I mean, my, my piece of this answer is about acknowledging, you know, kind of like the idea of Black History Month, but sort of acknowledging uh, how we are a product of our diverse culture and it makes us more um, vibrant. You know, it, that our diverse culture makes us more, it makes things more interesting. I, have, I was at an apartment with a, of a neo-Nazi <laughs> in his apartment and he had a bunch of DVDs, he had a big Nazi flag on the wall and a bunch of, and his favorite TV show was The Family Guy and he had like all the seasons of The Family Guy on DVD. And I said, man, you, you like this show? Oh, yeah, it's so great. I'm like, let's, let's look at the back. Let's look at who made this show. You know, these names sound like they might be kind of Jewish sounding names. He's like, oh, like, so, you know, if you had your world, right, these people would not exist. And you probably wouldn't have the show that you love. And he's like, oh, uh. <laughs> you know, it was just a little way in to uh, help him see, oh, yeah, even though I full of, you know, these ideas, actually, I'm benefiting from, yeah, he was in love yeah. with uh, that, that woman from that 70s show, Milan. Milan, M Mila Kunis, I think her name is. Yep, yep. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, she's Jewish. And he's like, no! Don't. Yeah, he was his favorite, like his favorite celebrity crush, and it just crushed him. I'm like, don't, dude. So when we acknowledge, when we sort of celebrate diversity, when we sort of, you know, can help people realize that it, it benefits all of us. Um, mm -hmm. I had a, I, one quick little story. I was talking to these, I got called to this high school because there were these skinheads in the classroom, these races. This kid had made a, a scale model of Auschwitz for his history project. And we were, ha I was having lunch with the students and um, one of the kids, one of the uh, skinheads was eating a bagel and the other was eating a peanut butter sandwich. And I'm like, you guys are the worst Nazis I've ever seen. Bagel comes from Jewish culture. Peanut butter was invented by George Washington Carver. You guys should be eating like bratwurst or something. And they're like, what? Uh, and one of those kids contacted me and he's like, I, you know, I was really thinking about what you're saying, uh, Randy. and. Um, I love peanut butter. I don't want to give it up. <laughs> it was like that yeah. little thing for him was a window into seeing, oh, what else? What else am I not seeing about the diverse nature of my culture and how I benefit from it? So peanut peanut butter, that's the solution to all our problems. That is fascinating. Yeah. That's it's, like it's absolutely fascinating so that a bagel <laughs> and peanut butter. Ugh. All right. Well, we're coming up. Uh, at the end of the uh, of our time together, we got a couple more questions I want to get out there, and I thank everybody for uh, for staying with us. Um, one is, when we look at bias training, um, what are the best options? Uh, Katie had had a question here, and some other people had reached out and asked, uh, you know, their videos or other things. Yeah. A lot of stuff feels out of touch. Um, what do you think is the best way to train a team? Yeah. Um, well, it's the, I mean, the, the, the quick answer is the reflective piece to get people to engage in their reflection on their own experiences. Mm -hmm. I do an a experiment, experiment assignment with my students where I have people uh, write about their experience with oppression and with privilege, because we've all had some element of that. Uh, if you're a native English speaker, you've had privilege. If you're right handed, you've had privilege. If you, you know, or cisgendered, you have privilege, but you've also had an experience of being oppressed, even if it was being a young person, right? When young person, like nobody listens to me. Um, so we to, ha to have an assignment where people get to sort of reflect on both of those elements of their experience and how that felt uh, and how they benefited from privilege. Usually you don't even see it. Like right-handed people do not see right-handed privilege, but left-handed people see it. Uh, so yeah. to, to have to be able to reflect on those things as a way of building empathy with other people who don't have um, who don't have the, the same privileges that you have, and that's sort of one of the ways that I've tried to work through to get people to start having those conversations. I talk a lot about right-handed people because uh, it's an easy way. <laughs> you know, right-handed people don't see the benefit that they have, and, and left-handed people don't hate them for it. They don't think they're right. bad people. It's just an unexamined advantage that you have in our society. Yeah. I had a student who was a National Guardsman, National Guards person, and she said even the 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 safeties on her rifle were set up for right-handed people. So as a left-handed person, she had to kind of go over the gun. That uh, might be a problem. That might be something that the U.S. military should look at. There you go. That could be, yeah. yeah. 
Um, and I, all I can think about is scissors. And every time somebody left-handed had to use scissors and I have to watch the awkwardness of, because yeah. those scissors were the thumb But even our smartphones here. are set up for right-handed people. I mean, there's just yeah. so many. I had to have a conversation with a left-handed person who went down the whole list of things where how you sit in a restaurant and how cars are set up and on and on and on. My dad is left-handed, so I have a little bit of empathy, but he's a little bit of a joke. <laughs> we were at a hardware store one time when I was a kid, and he, he asked me to go over and ask them if they had any left-handed hammers. Oh, <laughs> and I did, nice. and they were like, no. And I'm like, you, you're oppressing left-handed people. And they're like, there's no <laughs> such thing as a left-handed hammer. My dad was just laughing. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Um, the last question I had, and, and it kind of gets back to the book, you know, uh, reading the book, and, and I do recommend it for everybody if, if you're getting – uh, started, it will help you understand where your biases are. Um, and they start off really gentle. At the end, they get a, a little bit, you know, they're really making their case at the end um, about a really important stuff. But the question I have is, is there any newer research? A lot of people talk about how this book's a little bit old. Is there anything new going on that we should be paying attention to? Um, well, what, you know, what the, the latest research is on, uh, on, on the sort of the, the ways of interrupting implicit bias. How, you know, we, we've, we learn these things very early on and how you, how you sort of learn to rewire the brain. And we, you know, people right. who are addicts learn to rewire the brain. I mean, you're, they're working on a cognitive level. And so there is research about sort of um, being able to, this all sounds very therapeutic, being able to sort of recognize when those things are happening and redirect the thoughts and it requires work. I mean, anybody who's gone, gone through addiction uh, counseling knows that there's a lot of labor involved. But there, the new research now is about how we kind of can switch to the other, you know, like the fork in the road to kind of go to that one and to look okay. at um, sort of what, what we call mindfulness. I mean, that's a very broadful term, but the notion of being mindful of our own biases and, and sort of retraining the brain to switch away from uh, the implicit bias. So that's fascinating. A lot of that is being done at Harvard right now. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, Randy, I can't thank you enough for being here today and, and helping great. us as, really fun. as we f figure things out. Anything? You can find uh, me, by the way, at Randy. Bla I, my wife told me, mention your website, randyblazak.com. <laughs> so if you're interested you in, the, in the work that we're doing here in Portland, uh, please feel free to find me or contact me. You can connect to, to, to me through that website. Shoot me a message. Well, that sounds great. Randy, thank you so much once again. Um, everybody who tuned in today, thank you for taking the time uh, to be with us today. We will get uh, this video posted and the podcast out. And with that, once more, I want to thank MailChimp, Envision, and Platform SH for all they do for us. And get on with your weekend. And, and once again, remember, get some rest. This is, a, this is a long effort that we've got ahead of us, and we need to make sure we keep ourselves healthy so we can do good for the world. Talk to everybody later. Thanks again, Randy. Yeah, sure thing.